Hi guys, and welcome to this masterclass series all about Lightroom Classic. Now we're gonna be breaking this down into five different sections, going over specific tools, but also a few helpful tips to make your editing workflow a little bit quicker when you go ahead and use Lightroom Classic. Now today we are going over the basic sliders found within the develop panel of Lightroom Classic. And I'm gonna start right now. So over the next five weeks, we are going to understand and master all of the tools that you can find in the develop panel of Lightroom Classic. Week one, today, we're going to be going over the basics panel. So that's white balance, exposure, but also saturation. Week two, we're going to be going over the tone curve. This is a really helpful tool if you wanna change your exposure, also do a little bit of color grading. Week three, we're gonna be going over the HSL or hue, saturation, and luminance sliders. Week four, we're going to be going over the color grading sliders. Now these are really helpful and new to Lightroom Classic. And then week five, we're going to be going over calibration, a massively underused tool I think found within Lightroom Classic. Another thing to note is we're not going to be using either Lightroom Mobile or Lightroom CC. These are actually separate apps. These can be found both using your iPhone, iPad, but also on your, obviously your desktop. We're just going to be using Lightroom Classic. So with all that out of the way, let's start week one with the basic sliders. Right guys, so the very first thing I'm gonna do is gonna go ahead and just open Lightroom Classic. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and work on a raw photo. And if you'd like to follow along with the same raw photo that I'm going to be using in this tutorial, go ahead to the link in the description. So what we're gonna do firstly is we're gonna go ahead, obviously open Lightroom Classic, and then we're gonna go over to the develop panel on the right hand side. This is where we're gonna be doing all of the changes to our photo over the next five weeks. Then once we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and this, this week, we're gonna go ahead to the basic panel. I'm gonna go ahead and open that. And as you can see we've got a range of sliders that look fairly daunting at first but they are what we call the basic sliders found within Lightroom. Now these change basically the fundamentals of your photo. So firstly the white balance, exposure, but they also change the amount of color aka the saturation of your photo. Now when we go ahead and open this up first we're going to go in this tutorial we're going to start from the very top and we're going to work all the way to the bottom. Now the first thing we come across is the word treatment. Now this is an easy one to understand and it's got two buttons, color and black and white. And as you can imagine, one obviously converts into color and one converts into black and white. Now, if you shot your photo in black and white, so let's say you go ahead and change the user settings of your camera to black and white, you can't now convert it into color. But if you shot in color, you'll be able to convert it into black and white. So for obvious reasons, I always recommend people, unless you're really just wanting to shoot in black and white, I highly recommend shooting in color, then converting it into black and white afterwards. But this is how you can convert a photo into black and white. Just simply go ahead and press that button. And as you can see, that photo is now black and white. And that will change a few settings within Lightroom Classic. It will limit the amount of things you can do, because obviously you can't change the hue, because there is now no hue, because hue is obviously converting colors. It will obviously allow you to change the saturation of color bands and luminance, but it won't obviously let you change color, because what you've done is you've removed all color. You've desaturated the entire photo. Now, what we could do is just go ahead and convert it back into color. That's what we're going to be working in this tutorial. The next thing we've got is profiles. Now, if you've ever owned a camera before, the likelihood you've probably seen color profiles in your camera. I shoot Canon and they're called color profiles. And these color profiles might be called landscape or fine detail. When you're shooting JPEG, they are baked into the actual camera photo itself. Now, what they do is they basically tell, you tell the camera, I'm shooting a landscape and it might oversaturate the photo maybe. Or if you're shooting portraits, it might maybe desaturate certain tones within the photo. They're very minor presets that you can do to your photo. But if you go ahead and shoot raw, these are forgotten about. Basically what the photo or the, what the camera does is it goes, ah, you're shooting raw. What I'll do is I'll disable this feature. So even if you are shooting raw and you turn on fine detail or turn on portrait mode, unless you're shooting JPEG, this makes no difference. But what was if you actually really like the landscape look or the landscape color profile within your camera? Well, what you can do is you can go ahead and turn it back on again when you're in Lightroom Classic. So we've got the profile here. If you go here, you've got Adobe Color, but you've also got Adobe Landscape, Adobe Portrait, Adobe Standard, Adobe Villid, Adobe Monochrome, which is black and white. And then if you want to, you can go to whatever camera profile settings you use, go ahead and download them from their website, and you can actually import them there, which is actually really handy. I don't do this because 
I create my own look, but if you do specifically like maybe the fine detail look of a Canon 5D, let's say, you can go ahead and import it. You just need to make sure you find the right one on Canon's website. So that is that section there. The next section here is all to do with white balance. Now, like the camera, and you'll see a lot of these settings are mirrored from the actual camera itself, you've got a bunch of kind of presets that you can do for your white balance, for example. Now, we'll ignore this sliders for the moment. Let's go to where you can see white balance, and you can see there's a button here called as shot. If you go ahead and click that, you'll notice these sound very familiar if you've ever changed the white balance of your photo. So you've got auto, daylight, cloudy, shade, tungsten, fluorescent, goes on and on. What I recommend doing is changing it to custom. This will allow you to change the temperature and tint depending on your own preferences. Let's say you shot at sunset and you've shot it at the wrong Kelvin, let's say, so you've shot it a bit too warm or a bit too cool, you'll be able to customize it to your own heart's desire. But let's say you wanna be absolutely precise. You wanna be millimeter correct when it comes to what white balance you've got in your photo. But you don't know what is the right white balance because it is, I must say, even as a professional photographer, it is quite difficult to work out. Well, luckily, Lightroom Classic has got a feature built in that we can use. So if you go ahead and just ignore those sliders for the moment, you've got this button here or this little eyedropper tool. This is called the white balance selector. So what it does is you click it, what it'll do is come up with an eyedropper tool and it'll come up with a little pinpoint. And as you can see, we can go ahead and select a certain color within the photo. Now, what we wanna do is select something with a neutral tone. So something that's white or something that's gray. You wanna aim, if you're in an ideal situation, for 18% gray. Weirdly, that seems to be the best way to correct your white balance. Now you'll notice a few photographers will have what you call a white balance card or a gray card, for example. This allows basically you to select the exact color within your ambience. So for instance, I'm shooting here. Every time I go ahead and shoot a YouTube tutorial, I've got a little gray card. Now this is helpful in most situations, but what was if you didn't have one? Well, what we can do is find something neutral within the photo. Now, if you've got a portrait photo, the whites of your eyes works absolutely perfectly. But because this is a landscape photo, we know that snow is white. So we can go ahead and click. And what it will do is basically you're telling Lightroom, this is white. You know this is white or this is neutral, should I say. That, so basically what it'll do is it'll convert all of the colors globally of the photo to that specific white balance. And what it will do is it will actually move these sliders. But what's really nice is let's say you wanna make it a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler, you can go ahead and drag it. So obviously with the temperature slider, you drag it over to the left, that makes it obviously very cool. And you drag it over to the right, it makes it very warm. And obviously the tint slider does the same thing. So if we drag it over to the left, makes it very green, drag it over to the right, it makes it very purple. And the balance of these two will create your white balance. You can actually change and customize this in your camera, but if you didn't do that, you can go ahead and do it in post, but only if you've shot in RAW. So that is the main sections of your white balance. Again, what I'm gonna do is check that eyedropper tool and you can probably see a little bit of a change. Click that and you can see it's made that photo a little bit warmer. So the next section is called tone. And what that does is it changes the overall exposure of your photo. Now it's broken up into six separate sliders that will allow you to change all parts of the exposure of your photo. Now to best understand exposure, I highly recommend looking up what does a histogram do. A histogram is basically the best mathematical way of working out what is the correct exposure for your photo. It's a really, really important to understand. I'll go over it briefly, but there are many, many videos. Other, other YouTubers have done them. I don't think I've done one. I might have done. If I have done, I'll make sure to link it in the description. But basically, they're really helpful to understand how mathematically exposure is done within your photo. Now, if we go ahead to right at the top, this is your exposure. And as you can see, it's broken up into five different sections. You've got blacks, you've got shadows, you've got your midtones, or this in this particular case is called exposure. You've got your highlight and then you've got your whites. And as you can see, if we go ahead and drop down here, these are replicated in sliders. So you've got your main exposure, which is obviously the mid-tones. Then you've got highlights, which is found on the right-hand side. Then you've got shadows, which is found on the left-hand side. But then you've got your whites, which are found on the far right. And then you've got your blacks found on the far left. And all of these little kind of bumps that you can see here are where the pixels are found. It's like the 
basically what does Lightroom does is it counts how many pixels and it creates almost like a graph, for example, of how many pixels are found in certain parts of your exposure format. So for instance, in this particular case, the photo is very, very dark, as you can see. So all of the information is found in the very far left, which as you can see, if I hover over it, is shadows, but also blacks. But obviously the sky is quite white. So as you go over to the far right, you can see that's where your highlights are found and that's where your whites are found. So ideally, what you want to do is to have a lot of information in the midtones, a little bit of information in the highlights, and a little bit of information in the blacks. You don't want these really tall peaks found either on the left or the right hand side because they are just, unless you're on specifically doing it, let's say you're shooting a very bright day, realistically, you want all that information in the midtones. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and change this photo. So firstly, we've got exposure, which obviously changes the overall exposure of your photo. Now, if you go ahead and bring that up, as you can see, we've brought up the, all that information that you can see in the kind of foreground area, but we have massively blown out the sky. If you go ahead and press J on your keyboard, it'll bring up your clipping information. So red is when you've clipped it too far bright, and blue is when you've clipped it too far dark. So if I go ahead and just for an example, if I go ahead and bring that down, you can see all this blue information at here. There's no information found in either the red areas or the blue areas. So you really, if you, if you can help it, you don't want to clip your photo. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and bring that up ever so slightly. Let's go ahead and bring it up by around 0.5 of a stop. Next, we've got here is contrast. Now, contrast is the difference or the amount of difference between the darkest point of your photo and the brightest point of your photo. Think about taking your exposure and adding contrast pulls that information further apart. Now, there's a term called dynamic range, which is how many kind of dynamic range points you can find within a photo. Some, let's say, a new cameras can shoot 14 stops of dynamic range. Contrast basically controls the dynamic range of your overall photo. Again, pulling it apart or pushing it together again, depending on how much exposure or how much contrast you add to your photo. So what we could do is add in a little bit of contrast. Don't mind, again, don't mind going too far. Basically with all these sliders, the best way to say it is don't, don't go too mad, mad basically. The minor changes will make a better overall outcome. You'll notice a lot of beginner photographers will go, like they'll go to clarity and they'll whack it all the way to 100, which like, whoa, that's just way too much. So what I recommend doing is adding in small amounts periodically. I think that's a really, really good way of doing it. So what we're gonna do is we'll take our contrast and we're gonna go ahead and add in around 15% there. Now we've got our highlights, which again, as you can see, if we hover over, we can see it's controlling that bright areas of the photo. So that is predominantly the sky. So what we can do is we can bring that down. And as you can see, if we bring that down, we're not changing the overall exposure of the photo, we're just controlling the highlights. And as you can see, there is a lot of information that was originally lost with the kind of first photo that we saw, which is, as you can see, really helpful if you wanna bring back any dynamic range within the sky there. Then we've got the shadows, which again does the same thing. What I recommend doing is raising these. And as you can see, if we raise them up, we bring them back a lot of that information that you can see in the foreground. And already the photo is looking really, really good. Then we've got whites, which again, as you can imagine, just controls the whites. Now in this particular case, I like raising it slightly, but not by too much, just by a little bit amount. And then obviously blacks, as you can imagine, do the exact opposite. So we've got the blacks here. What we'll do is we'll reduce those down as well. Now, as you can see, we've got these blue speckles in the bottom right. If you really wanted to do, you could raise up those blacks. And as you can see, those blue speckles disappear. But sometimes that can make the photo look matte. And I don't necessarily want to do that in this particular case. So what I'm actually going to do is just drop it down ever so slightly. I'm going to break that rule I just told you, but I am doing it for a relevant point. So as you can see, we have made already quite a large difference to the photo. If you want to see the before and after, what you can do is go ahead and press backslash on your keyboard, and that will show you the before, which as you can see in the top right hand corner of the screen, you can see it says before, and then we can see after. And already we've made a massive change to the photo. So now let's go ahead and talk about texture, clarity, and dehaze. So texture, clarity, and dehaze are a really good way of controlling almost the amount of contrast per pixel of your photo. Now let's go ahead and talk about texture first. Texture, 
as you can imagine, controls the amount of texture in your photo, but not texture of the entire photo. It does ignore ISO grain. It controls the fine texture that you can find in your photo. It's a good way of naturally sharpening your image. Now, if we go ahead and zoom in and give you a good example of what texture does, as you can see, we've got some rock formations, we've got some trees, we've got some overall different types of texture. Now, if we go ahead and increase the texture slider, as you can see, it increases the defining characteristics of that texture. Now, what's really nice is if you go to maybe, let's say, the sky, and then we go ahead and increase the texture, you can see it doesn't really do anything. And again, and that is because inside the sky, there is not much texture to be seen. So the texture slider is very special close to kind of how it masks because it only works on certain areas where texture is found. Now again, don't want to go too far on this because it ends up making the photo look overly sharpened and it just doesn't make it look realistic. So what we can do is be very, very subtle with this slider to get the best results possible. So we're going to go ahead and choose 15 in this particular case. So let's go ahead and move on to clarity. Now, clarity and contrast are almost brothers and sisters when it comes to sliders. Contrast, again, like I was saying, pushes apart the brightest points and the darkest points, but that is on a global scale. So how bright and how dark the actual pure colors are. Clarity, I think is very similar, but it works on a pixel based level. So it's the difference between per pixel, which can sometimes, it's basically like contrast, but on steroids. So you've got to be really subtle with this slide and be really careful, otherwise you can make the photo look HDR really, really quickly. So what I'm gonna do is go to the clarity slide here and increase that like so. But if I go ahead and whack it up, you can see immediately this makes this photo look way too much HDR. There is just too much information. It makes it look like color puke. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be very, very careful with this. So we're gonna only get to go to maybe 10% here. Now, if you're working with portraits, so if you're doing any photos with people, I actually recommend negatively impacting the clarity. If you reduce it by around 10 to 15%, you can actually smooth out the skin tones. Don't go too far, because you'll end up losing all that information in the hair, but I must say it can really help you out, especially if you just want to smooth out those skin tones in a natural way. But in landscape photos, I recommend adding it in to around me 10, 15%, but no more, because otherwise you'll make the photo, in my opinion, look terrible. In your case, it may work for you, but in my professional setting, I don't like clarity too high on my photos. And the last thing we've got here is dehaze. Now dehaze does it kind of does what it says on the tin. It removes haze from your photo. Now haze is found in a specific kind of area of exposure, which is in between the kind of midtones and highlights. That's where haze is found within your photo. If there is no haze in your photo, then remove, you don't need to use dehaze. But in this particular case, if you go have a look in the very far, we've got this beautiful waterfall. As you can see, there is a little bit of haze to it because the, what the basically the blacks aren't true black and that is what haze is. So what we can do is go to the haze slider here and what that will do is that will just impact that area. And what it will do is it will add dynamic range and it will pull kind of the contrast of the darkest darks and the whitest whites and it will pull them apart from each other, removing that haze. And if I go ahead and move it, if you go have a look at where that exposure is and where that is on the white balance, you can see it's only impacting kind of this area of the kind of histogram, which is where you'll predominantly find your haze. So as you can see, adding in a little bit of dehaze there will help the overall exposure. So what I'm gonna do is go to 20% there. And as you can see, already that's looking quite nice. And the last two sliders is vibrance and saturation. So I'm gonna reduce those down to zero. Now I have actually made a separate video on this. You may have watched already, but if you haven't, there is a slight difference between vibrance and saturation. Vibrance controls the colors or the saturation of just the mid-tone colors, where saturation affects colors globally across your photo. So let's go ahead and just quickly look at saturation first. If I go ahead and increase saturation on all colors, the darkest colors, the brightest colors over here, even the sky, the saturation of the photo, so that's the amount of color found per pixel of your image has been increased and it will increase by the amount. So for instance, in this case, we've added it be increased by 64%. But what Vibrance does differently is it will only increase the colors found within the midtones. Again, looking at where our histogram is, it will only affect roughly that middle part that you can see. So for instance, if you've got a very bright sky or for instance, you've got a very dark scene, it won't add saturation to those areas. 
Vibrant is a lot more subtle. It is nowhere near as powerful as saturation. And for instance, let's say if you're doing portrait, for example, Vibrant is really good because it doesn't necessarily impact the skin tones as much as saturation. Again, if you go ahead and just whack up that saturation, it makes the photo look, in my opinion, terrible. And again, it falls down that same situation of making it look like color puke. But if you go ahead and whack up Vibrant, it doesn't have that same power. It is still, in my opinion, fairly ugly, but it isn't as powerful. So you can add maybe 30% vibrance, but in this particular case, I wouldn't add any more saturation. And to be honest with you, that's all you're going to need to know about the main basics panel. These main 13 sliders make a dramatic impact to your photo. And as you can see, we haven't touched anything. All we've done is these 13 sliders, and I can show you the before and after and that is a massive difference. And if I go down to the bottom right hand corner, go ahead and click this Y symbol, we can actually see the before and after both on screen. And as you can see, there is a big difference. It is far too dark on the left. And I would say the exposure is correct on the right hand side. What I'll actually do is maybe break, make it a little bit brighter. Again, I don't mind losing some information in the highlights as long as I've got all that information in the shadows. And what I actually do is raise up these blacks just ever so slightly. I might actually reduce that back down to zero again. I quite like that look. And as you can see, this photo is way better. So if I go back to the full size, here is the before and here is the after. And as you can see, there are all the information I think you need about the basic sliders found within Lightroom Classic. Again, guys, if you want to like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, it really does help me out. And obviously, make sure to stay subscribed if you are already, because we've got more information about Lightroom Classic coming in week two, week three, week four, and week five. We're gonna be going over everything that you need to know, I think, about the main develop panel found within Lightroom Classic. I've been James for Photo Fever, and I'll catch you guys next time.